How is the pandemic affecting our worship life? Does the use of Zoom and other technology like it have an effect over time over, uh, on the character of our worship and how can we make it better? Hello, my name is Pastor David Burkadal. My wife, the Reverend Sally Welch, and I are co-producing these video streams of Living Water to help give a sense of connection as we reflect on the meaning of this pandemic from a Christian perspective and how we can be connected in, in a sense that is real and that uh, makes us uh, more of a body of Christ than individual uh, pieces here and there. We are uh, doing these videos on YouTube. There's a link down below and the texts uh, of the main theme sections are put on a blog. You can uh, reach them uh, through the, the uh, links uh, down below. Uh, we're hoping to expand our, our video and our, uh, our live Facebook, YouTube video, little edited, um, our blog to a podcast by the end of the year, uh, Living Water Radio, so please uh, keep an eye out uh, for, for that. Uh, Sally's sister Susan, for whom we've been praying, died a week ago yesterday after a valiant struggle with pancreatic cancer. We deeply appreciate your prayers as we mourn, even as we thank God for the promise of eternal life in a living relationship with Jesus Christ that knows no end. I got a phone call this morning uh, from a colleague in Tanzania, uh, Dean George Pindua, and we talked about various things. Uh, I asked how uh, things were going with uh, the people there in Tanzania with the pandemic, and he said cases are going down. Here, they're just the opposite. The LA area is the most infected uh, uh, area, urban area in the country. Uh, we are now on uh, uh, stay-at-home uh, orders. Businesses are closing down or pulling back. There are restrictions uh, on where we can go and um, the, the ability to, to stay uh, physically distanced has now been greatly improved because we can't go anywhere. But hopefully this with the mask wearing and the hand sanitizing will, will bring down the, the curve, will save lives and enable us to go back to, if not normal, at least the new normal and get our economy back on track again. Uh, it's, it's just, uh, I don't know, it just strikes me so uh, odd that the people who seem to be complaining the most about these restrictions are often the people who are the least willing to do what has been demonstrated to, to keep the, the numbers of infections down and, and would enable us not to have these restrictions if, if they were observed. At any rate, that's where we are in the coronavirus. In the church here, we've just started a new year. So happy new year. Today is the eighth day of the new season of Advent. Advent means coming. We celebrate the coming of Christ to Christmas, uh, even as we stand now between Advents, the second coming, the, the coming of, of, uh, of Christ in judgment at the end of time is the, is the, uh, the Advent for which we also long. The, the very last words uh, almost of the Bible are, come Lord Jesus. We await for, for that time when, when there'll be a new heaven and a, and a new earth. There'll be no more coronavirus. There'll be no more death. There'll be no more suffering. And, and we will be with Christ forever uh, in, in heaven in that joyful reunion, that the marriage feast that never ends. Uh, the word Advent is, is somewhat foreign, I suppose, to... Uh, non-liturgical Christians, although it's very familiar to the vast majority of Christians in the world today and, and throughout time. Uh, worship, uh, uh, this liturgical worship is structured around a church year that has two cycles, Christmas and Easter, and then an extended period that allows us a time to reflect on the meaning of the Christian life. It has been meaningful to people and continues to be meaningful throughout uh, time. Uh, worship today, however, in some cases uh, has been more uh, designed around entertainment, what's, what's popular, uh, what will bring people in. Uh, sometimes it's built around the, the needs of the congregation for better self-esteem. And still others, it's designed to fulfill a political or 
a social agenda. But liturgical worship is none of these things. Worship, and think about that mean worship, what that word means. It's the open-hearted, open-minded, powerful direction of our prayer, praise, and thanksgiving to the one true living God. We are empowered through the Holy Spirit to, to be in worship. All that's necessary for worship is the presence and power of the Holy Spirit. Some people, however, find that, that worship boring. Uh, some churches have been built on the uh, philosophy that we're not like those boring people. We're, come and check us out. We're, we're, uh, we're structured around what people actually want. They find uh, our services uh, uh, boring. Uh, they uh, are oddly structured. They wear old-fashioned costumes. Uh, their droning sermons go on and on, and who knows when to stand and when to sit. Actually, some Lutherans say that too as well, I suppose. Uh, but uh, people outside, that, that, that's kind of a, a friendly critique, uh, a means uh, a, a suggestion for improvement. But, but there are churches that are built around just the opposite, and, and, and people go there, and, and people are come to Christ there. And I, I, I'm not saying that, 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 that the Holy Spirit isn't present and at work there. I make no judgment about them except to say that McDonald's sells an awful lot of hamburgers, and they're very popular. But I wouldn't say that a steady diet is going to feed you or in the long run even be good for you. Instead, uh, one of my colleagues wrote on a Facebook page uh, about a conversation she had with someone on an airplane who had found out she was a Lutheran pastor and talked about her church and how she didn't like the, the kind of church that my friend went to. And in the end, when she got back and was reflecting on this much longer conversation, she said she marveled at the attitudes of people who find ancient religion boring, but who find themselves endlessly fascinating. Liturgical worship is rooted in ancient structure. It's the same structure uh, with which Jesus worshipped, a gathering, the word, and ascending. The only thing that differentiates Christian worship from the synagogue service that, that in which Jesus worshipped was the addition of Holy Communion. The three Gospels are the stories of Jesus' birth, death, and, and particularly his death and resurrection, are part of liturgical worship. They are the dominant gospel that is read in a three-year cycle. Uh, during this three-year cycle, we um, uh, read from Scripture in a way that's prescribed so that if you come to church every year for three years, you'll hear just about the, the entire Scripture, certainly the, the, the whole story of, of salvation history read out loud every three years. Uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John, the Gospels that are somewhat similarly structured. Uh, I'm sorry, Matthew, Mark, and Luke the, are the three-year cycle. They're similarly structured. John is sprinkled in, form the, the Gospel readings. There's one from the, from the Old Testament prophets, one from the Psalms in the Old Testament, or the Hebrew Scriptures, one from one of the Gospels, and a reading from one of the uh, books of the New Testament that are not Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. Uh, these are all designed to give us a, the broad picture, but also it, it uh, requires that preachers preach on the whole of the Bible and not just a few texts that they are familiar with and like and come back to again and again according to whatever their, uh, their favorite theme is. The, the structure exposes the, uh, the people to lots of the Bible, the primary way in which God speaks to us, but it's also a means by which time itself is ordered through the church here, where we get a sense of, of a, the bigger picture, the, the, the presence of God that is larger than ourselves. Our highest expectation for worship, uh, however, in, in most churches, not just uh, uh, the non-liturgical churches, but even in the liturgical services, is that we get something out of it. And that is nothing like what actual worship is about. Uh, Today, the worship experiences we attend are likely to be on YouTube with slightly higher production values or on Zoom or, or something like it, which gives us a somewhat more immediate sense of connection with others. But it really doesn't matter what kind of um, means by which uh, we use for worship. Worship is worship. I've, I've heard that in some churches, worship attendance is growing because people can come from all over the country 
to be on these Zoom services. They can attend multiple Zoom services very easily just with a click of a mouse or a tap on a pad. And in some places it's declining because it's different. People haven't adjusted, haven't gotten used to that, that sense of, of being uh, apart even as we see each other face to face. Uh, I don't know if it's because we don't get to go to the coffee hour afterward or, or uh, at least in, in a more relaxed and, and person-to-person way. You've got to talk to everybody. Um, or if it's just something with, that has to do with technology. Some places it's up, some places it's down. But again, as far as worship is concerned, it really makes no difference what the means is. Worship is worship. And when I say that, I, I, I suppose someone might think, well, Thank you, Captain Obvious, and worship is worship, right? But there's a character to worship that truly is worship that's different from just going to church. And I want to talk about that uh, a little bit uh, today. Uh, Soren Kierkegaard, uh, the Danish philosopher and theologian, once said that when we leave a liturgical worship service experience, the question to ask ourselves isn't what did I get out of that? Liturgical worship focuses on worship. It requires us to be engaged so that when we go out, the question we should ask ourselves is, how did I do? Not what did I get, but how did I do? The paradox of, of liturgical worship is that if our focus is on God, we receive more than we could ever ask for or imagine. If our focus is on ourselves, and what did we get out of it, then we haven't worshipped. We've just gone to a a performance, and and we we evaluated more about that in a minute. Um, Full-throated worship is, in the presence of God, is what the world needs, and I would say the world wants. In a well-known summary of of the Catholic Church and other churches' efforts to engage uh, the poor, particularly in South America and and in the two-thirds world, uh, there was for a while this effort to uh, be a, a, a theologian of liberation, to talk about the meaning of scripture as being liberation, and that took on the meaning of particularly political and social liberation. And as such, uh, the, the fundamental um, uh, theme of, of that theology is that the church must opt for the poor. And in in reflection on that, it was, and after we had some experience, it was said, the church opted for the poor, the poor opted for Pentecostalism. There's a need for that immediate experience and and a way of engaging that experience with real life that is not an academic theology. Uh, it, It involves worship, worship that is directed toward God, worship that truly is worship. A United Methodist uh, elder, Elder Womack, wrote an article on this and reflecting on uh, Kierkegaard's uh, analysis of the difference between liturgical and non-liturgical worship. He writes, the Danish theologian Soren Kierkegaard compared worship with going to the theater, we, we might say also to a play in pre-pand- I mean to, uh, to uh, the movies in pre-pandemic terms. Uh, he said that for many Christians, going to worship was like going to see a play. They decided which show to see, dressed properly, arrived on time, were ushered to their seat, and waited for the show to begin. They were part of the audience that watched the performers, clergy, acolytes, musicians, and ushers. They put on the play. At some time, they could expect to pay for admission, usually during the intermission. After the play, they had dinner, went home, evaluated the performance, and decided whether or not to return to that theater or to look for another. Now, doesn't that describe a lot of, particularly people who are ser- searching, who are shopping for a church? One of my colleagues said whenever he heard somebody say, we're shopping for a new church, he thought to himself, well, I hope you find a bargain. Because when you're making a consumer decision, where that's kind of what you are looking for, aren't you? You want a bargain, something that gives you the most bang for your buck or whatever you have to contribute. That's not liturgical worship. Liturgical is not, worship is not, geared for what we get out of it, is geared for what we put into it. Our question is, how did I do? So here are my suggestions for making worship better, Zoom or otherwise, something that's more like uh, actual worship. In our our, uh, individualistic, consumer-oriented culture, it's the opposite of what our culture 
uh, offers us and teaches us to, to do and look for. But I think this is central to what it means to be a Christian in a worshiping community. First, number one, arrive on time. Uh, early enough, uh, or tune in, early enough to prepare for worship. Greet people who are there. Do whatever ministry with others you need to do before you go in for worship. But allow sufficient time beforehand, to, before worship, to prepare yourself for worship without any direction from the worship leader. I and many pastors begin worship by saying, let us prepare our hearts and minds as we enter into the presence of God. Okay, as I reflect on that as a person who is going to worship, I think it's, there, there's not enough time to do that before the service actually starts. You need to do that before you're told to do that. Go in, calm down, and prepare to enter into the presence of the living God. Second, preparing yourself means being open to God. We cannot worship without the presence of the Holy Spirit. Third, remove distractions. Turn off your cell phone, any other devices you're carrying, unless you're on call for work or, or some special emergency. Blow your nose, go to the bathroom, sit quietly in a quiet, quiet place. Get out of the way internally for, for, from what is about to happen. God is present. Ask that God would open you up and make it possible for you to worship God. Four, get out of God's way. I'm saying this several times. Get out of God's way. Open yourself. Some say open your heart and mind, but I think that the whole spirit person is involved in worship. So relax your body as well, your whole self. Make yourself vulnerable. Acknowledge that surprises are coming. It's not what you bring. It's, it's the worship of the living God in which you engage that brings you into the presence of the living God. Focus. Be mindful of God and God alone, of what God is doing there in worship. God does, makes it possible for us to worship, but we've got to get out of the way. Be mindful. Focus and retain that focus on God. Release your sorrow. Be grateful for what God is doing. Don't be embarrassed. When you make yourself vulnerable, you wonder, well, what am I going to do? What, what, what could happen? Don't worry about that. Just, just be focused on giving yourself to God. Confess your sin. Acknowledge your sorrow. Be grateful for forgiveness. Number eight, acknowledge awe as it comes, and it will come. Nine, worship with your whole self. Again, I want to come back to that theme, worship with your whole self. Direct your worship toward God. It's number nine. Listen, I'm sorry, number ten. Listen to God's voice. Be, worship is directed toward God. Listen with your whole, with, for God's voice. When worship is finished, seek out people who want to share experiences. Talk about what has just happened and how it connects and what it means for your lives to come. Worship does not end when you go out the door. It, I, I think when people come out of worship, if they've directed their worship toward God, if they've been in the presence of the living God, if they've heard from God through the word and sacraments in particular, people should be a little shaken. Uh, uh, that's what I think. That, that, that's what, what worship means to me. When you come out, you want to talk about it. You want to talk about what it means and how to apply that as you go forward with your week and with your life. Finally, don't ask, what did I get out of that? But ask yourself, how did I do in truly worshiping God? And again, the paradox is that if you truly worship God, you get more than you can ask or imagine. But if you go in with the attitude of, well, what, what are you going to do for me? Then not, none of that comes. Paul writes to the church uh, at Colossae in, in his letter to the Colossian, Colossians. Be above all, clothe yourselves with love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in the one body. And be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Teach and admonish one another in all wisdom and with gratitude in your hearts. Sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs to God. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. 
Let us pray. We thank you, Lord, that you have called us into your presence, that you invite us to worship. And we pray that in our worship we may be faithful to your call to direct our prayer, praise, and thanksgiving toward you, and open-hearted, open-minded, in, in the relaxing of our bodies, in, in the, the anticipation of your presence, so that in all of, of our worship it is you that might be glorified. We pray to be members of the body of Christ, the whole body at our local church, to be faithful in contributing and making a difference in the lives within and outside the church. For those caring for those with the coronavirus, we pray. For those who now have it, for those who are in danger of getting it, for those who are refusing to take simple steps to prevent it. We pray for all those awaiting a vaccine, struggling with the storms on the East Coast, and for those who are financially struggling. We pray for those who provide essential services, for those who receive them, and for those who seek the common good. We pray for those struggling with racial equality and for those who protect and serve. We, we, we pray for those who seek to derail the efforts of people of goodwill, that their hearts may turn from destruction and toward the building up of all people. We pray for those struggling with all forms of violence, with mental health issues, and with substance abuse. We pray for the most vulnerable among us, for those who feel insecurities of any kind, and for the leaders of our government and of our church. And toward this end, may we be your instruments. We bring before you the requests that have been made known to us. For Dean George Pindua and our brothers and sisters in Tanzania. For Manny, for, for his healing for, of the coronavirus. For one's mother for healing of cancer. For Jeff and Bill for your healing. For all these things and whatever else you know that we need, even before we ask. We bring them before you now in the words of the prayer you taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. So we're heading into cooler weather, but there's no less reason for us to stay hydrated. Stay hydrated in the streams of living water that is the Holy Spirit. For, for the, the work of God within us is what shapes us and makes us into the people God has created us to be. Open your hearts, your minds, your bodies. Allow God to shape you from within as the people of God. Remember your church. Pray for your pastor and your church leader. Contribute to your church. If you don't have a church, Find one, ask a friend, go online, Google it. Uh, find one that you feel comfortable supporting and support it. Make sure it's there for you when you return to, to full in-person worship and, and the work of the church in the world. Remember to wash your hands, wear a mask, socially distance, stay at least six feet away from others. If you have to go out, uh, go out where there are the least crowds. Uh, do whatever you can in order to to keep the curve low, to prevent others from, from, from getting the virus and to get us back into the, at least the new normal and return of our economy. Finally, be, if, you're, if you're having thoughts of suicide or if you're having mental health struggles, call somebody. People around you do want you to know that you are not alone. Uh, it may feel like that sometimes, but, but if you just reach out, you will find very quickly that people do care about you and want to care for you. Reach out. Be kind to everybody, everybody you meet today. We're all struggling, but allow, don't allow that struggle to, to harden your heart. Go out and, and do something good. You don't even have to go out. In fact, you shouldn't go out. Uh, go online. Go, go text somebody. Call somebody. Connect with somebody to let them know that you're thinking about them and, and uh, ask how things are going for them. And, and do something uh, kind for them. Let us now receive the benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen.